Welcome to Story Talk, a roundtable discussion of a single story at a time. Story Talk is a production of One Week Critique, an Iowa based arts and education nonprofit that offers educational resources and editorial support to students and teachers of the literary arts. You can learn more about us and our programs or support our work by visiting our Patreon page or by going to our website, oneweekcritique.com. That's the number one, weekcritique.com. And please like and subscribe to our channels on YouTube and Apple. Help us continue producing excellent content. I'm Matthew Schmidt, here with Adam Alsergani. Hello. And Ingrid Wensler. Hey there. Today we'll be discussing Congress from the 2004 collection Honored Guest by Joy Williams. The story follows Miriam, her relationship with her forensic anthropologist husband, Jack, and Jack's student from the state university he teaches at, Carl. Carl, enamored with Jack, as most people are, gifts Jack four cured deer feet, directly from the text on that one, suggesting he make a lamp with it. This lamp turns out to have an allure for Miriam, and she begins a confounding relationship with and to it. Meanwhile, Carl has been taking Jack bow hunting, which leads to an accident causing brain damage and the loss of speech for Jack. Carl moves in with Jack and Miriam to take care of Jack and soon suggests a road trip. Touring the Southwest, Carl's truck dies in a small town. As the vehicle is being repaired, Miriam meets several people at the Horny Toad Bar, leading to her exploration of a taxidermy museum. So to begin with, Could we discuss the relationship between Miriam and Jack, how it began and falls apart, and how Carl and Jack become close while Miriam and the lamp form a bond? (laughs) Yeah. Um, Jack and Miriam are a, uh, what do they call it? Like a, I mean, uh, they're not like a, winter spring kind of combination right like they're emotionally very different people jack is an outgoing individual and one of the first things that we're going to learn in the story is about who jack is what his job is how unique his job is the kinds of claims that he makes and how like fun loving and outgoing and sort of extroverted he is is compared to miriam who's uh not necessarily a Debbie Downer, you know, but uh, definitely a uh, a Debbie in quietude. <laughs> and, you know, she spends a lot of time reading. And, you know, that's part of how the, the bond with the lamp forms, right? Like Carl's students have, they wear skull and crossbones shirts, um, right? They kind of worship him in a like semi-cult-like way. Uh, Miriam's always sort of like worried slash or at least thinking about if she's not worried that like other people seem to think she isn't good enough for Jack. Um, And even Jack sometimes is like bummed out by her, you know, Um, but Carl, like a lot of the story, it has a, it's not like fabulous, although Joy Williams does love to play on the edge of fabulism, Um, but it is, you know, uh, and it's not quite, you know, like hysterical realism in the way that like, you know, like Jonathan Franzen or David Foster Wallace are. Um, but there's something often like extreme and over the top about Joy Williams characters, at least in Honored Guest and other places, you know, she's a, one of my favorite living writers in part because Uh, she's got this chameleon quality where she covers a lot of range. And I, you know, I think I admire that capacity to change and think through different things in new ways. Um, But I say all that to say that like, there's something, I think it's not necessarily indicative of Joy Williams always, but it's indicative of this story that the way that people sort of do things has a logic that's not quite fairy tale like but where like, the story asks you to just suspend your goddamn disbelief and run with it. And so Carl is just a student who turns up and suggests that Jack would like bow hunting and maybe they can go together. And there's a semi-romantic quality about it, but he also turns up with these 
hooves and suggests specifically what Jack should do with it. And Jack being, you know, a little bit of a, a puppy dog, even if a like, you know, self-confident puppy dog immediately goes to making this lamp and <laughs> producing it. And so it becomes a sort of aftermath of, of Jack in Jack's absence to Miriam or semi-absence to Miriam. I think I'm gonna leave it there and, and let Ingrid kind of flesh out the rest of this chaos. Yeah, I think that's a good start. I mean, the story start begins with Miriam's discomfort in the relationship, or at least like socially her discomfort in the relationship. Um, and her awareness um, stated as fact, not as, you know, theory or um, worry that um, that some people don't understand why why she and Jack are together and why why her of all people those are the story's words um, and you know I think given um, Jack's profession um, forensic anthropologist um, adventurer. <laughs> sort one way that Miriam tries connecting with him is is through things that she's reading and through her sort of morbid fascination with what she does with what yeah with what he does rather um, you know she quotes something from Beckett that describes tears as liquefied brain um, and he's horrified by this um, there's a, there's a tension um, very early on in the story that, that persists and um, the story is interested in between interiority and exteriority. And Jack's someone who is a, mitch, is a mismatch in that way. Um, and the story, you know, kind of pokes fun at that. He, he returned from trips where he's identifying um, these bodies in these tragic accidents and he'd come back tanned and refreshed in the story's word with a crisp new haircut. Um, so Miriam's, Miriam's paying attention to those things. Um, and she seems to kind of want a little more symmetry sometimes, but kind of to Adam's point, an unusual thing about this story is it sort of brushes against those feelings. Um, kind of dips its toe in the water and almost gives you a feeling and then turns its attention to something else. Um, so it's it's sort of hard to navigate what, what Miriam's relationship to Jack is. And I mean, even how they ended up together, we're sort of put in the position of people who wonder about Miriam and Jack. Uh, you know, we don't know how they met um, or, you know, what it was that they saw in each other initially. We know that Miriam was passionate about sex initially and that her attention wanes a little bit there. Um, and, you know, the relationship dissipates a little similarly. Um, it's not... Um, how do I put this? It's not statedly to do entirely with the accident. That's sort of the turning point. But, um, you know, the, the relationship just isn't articulated throughout the story. And I mean, when it is articulated, it's articulated in these hilarious and strange and wonderful ways. Um, here's an example. As for herself, she felt that she'd driven to a grave and gotten out of the car, but left the engine running. I think that's kind of a good example of what the distinction Adam's making in terms of um, sort of hysterical realism and what the story is not. It, it, it almost uh, deals with those same kind of extremes, but not exactly. Um, it's, it's hyper specific in places and hyper vague in places and um, a lot of that, I think the way that Williams pulls that off is 
because the narration is so closely tied to Miriam and Miriam is eccentric to say the least. Um, I guess I've, I've been rambling a while now and I haven't touched so much on Carl, so I'll be brief on him. Um, I guess what I'd say, what I'd add to what Adam said um, is that we don't know that Carl is different from the other Duenies, um, who are um, Jack's um, admiring, fawning students. Um, initially, um, you know, he does have this puppy dog quality and he does seem to want to spend time with Jack, but that's not necessarily romantic um, time. And This and you know maybe it's it's hard to know what to do with um, Carl in retrospect. Um, he may be in love with Jack from the outset, or that love could be born out of guilt um, because he feels responsible for Jack's accident. Um, kind of hard to say, but I mean the story transitions to that relationship quickly and sort of inexplicably in the way that it often transitions. And that we go from Jack, or, or from Carl, like, you know, inviting Jack hunting, feeling responsible for this accident, giving up his life, selling his truck, moving in, sleeping in the study at first, and then all of a sudden he's in the bedroom, and it's kind of like that. Yeah, I might add to all that really briefly that um, Miriam does assert that Carl is in love with Jack. Um, she doesn't assert that that's a romantic love uh, to Ingrid's point. Um, and we don't really have a full context of that, although Carl dedicates himself pretty heavily to Jack, including moving into the same room and uh, deciding they should go on this trip. Uh, and whatever Carl's guilt is, right? Like there's something probably significant that I'd like to explore a little more about the fact that uh, Jack hurts himself in this hunting accident, uh, being deeply incompetent at it. And we see the edges of his incompetency at first through the fact that Miriam knows that he asserts things that other people claim are untrue. Uh, then through the hooves themselves, which uh, though Jack manages to get the lamp together uh, fairly quickly, he does have a little bit of trouble sawing at the leg bone and getting them even um, together. Uh, we don't get like a wild amount of detail about what the lamp looks like at the end, but whatever goes on with the lamp, right? Like it, it becomes so intense for Miriam and like, you know, Carl doesn't say like, piss off with this lamp. Like this is how Jack got hurt or this was the lead in to how this happened or there's no real evidence that he connects it. But Miriam gets worried about the lamp being in the back of the vehicle. So they actually like get a camper just so the lamp has its own space and the lamp comes into the bedroom with Miriam while the lamp or while Carl is going to the bedroom with Jack, um, even though Jack is incapacitated by his injuries. So I think the, the thing that is love and the thing that manifests as the coming in and coming out of the romances uh, of Jack and Miriam, of Carl and Jack, of Miriam and the Lamp, uh, all of those things are amorphous and puzzling and probably tied to the thing that I think of as most significant in the story this whole obsession with the objects of the dead, but also Miriam's obsession, which I think relates to that, her sort of kleptomania. Um, but let's, um, I'm not gonna ramble about that. I'm gonna let you guide us, Matthew. Yeah, uh, I will add that at first when Carl suggests Jack make a lamp from the hooves, uh, Miriam is horrified that the thing, this lamp is going to be in her house. Uh, but once it's done and Jack sets it up, she starts reading using the lamp as light. And that's how it like kind of starts. 
and she would sit at the lamp or, or in the chair next to the lamp uh, while Jack and Carl were out hunting. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, this story feels like it moves really quickly to me. Um, it's over 20 pages though, but it's like a fast read. And I was wondering what craft elements you thought Williams uses in order to achieve this. And maybe since you uh, touched upon it, uh, what is fabulous? Yeah. Um, fabulism is a, uh, right, it's realism with an element of the fabulous or the, the fantastic, right? Um, and right, like usually what that means is we're going through a largely realist story. The one that like comes to mind to me sort of off the top of my head is like a lot of people teach Kevin Brockmeyer's The Balloon. Um, and right, like it actually is this inordinately large swelling balloon that influences the shape of this whole community and encloses it. As I remember, it's been a long time since I've read it, but uh, um, right, like, Amy Bender engages in a lot of fabulism. We've done some work of Amy Bender's, although not particularly fabulous work. Another one that gets taught a lot is this sort of devolution story where this woman and her partner are sort of splitting up and he's, you know, it sort of manifests for him as like turning into, you know, a primate and then sort of working his way down the sort of like evolutionary chain um, throughout the course of the story so that we're dealing with something that could be happening, but then there's something that isn't actually happening. The thing about this story that makes it not fabulous to me is that there isn't anything I could point to in the story and say, this definitively could not happen. Although I think that there's a tone in fabulism often that it tends to be a little bit spare. And one of the, I mean, this is a general statement, not a statement about all work in that mode, but a lot of it gets achieved through sort of uh, filmic elements that are um, fairly dramatic. Um, and as a result, in order to keep the balance between whatever is magical or whatever is, um, right, whatever is uh, uncanny in the world, that thing, right, like things tend to be spare and they tend to be stark. So when that other thing enters in, it has a significance, but not a grotesqueness against the backdrop. And so I think here, one of the things that both makes it feel almost fabulous is that it has that spareness and it has a sort of strange way of describing the world, a sort of emphasis on particular images and particular moments, right? Like um, the kind of oddity of like naming a specific bone or mentioning the haircut or describing the hooves, but not describing the lamp and that kind of in and out of scene uh, that happens, but also the sentences then become stark as a result. Um, I'm literally opening to a random page in the story Hobbies were healthy, and he might even take Carl up on his bow hunting offer. Why didn't she get herself a hobby like baking or watching football, he suggested. He finished the lamp on a weekend and set it on an antique jelly cabinet in the sunroom. So, I mean, there's something very, like, we don't actually get in scene him saying to her, like, you should get a hobby, but we do get the details of what he suggests and baking and watching football are vastly different <laughs> things. But then we do get that antique jelly cabinet, right? Um, and it's in the sunroom, which also is never described. So we don't break into those scenes. And so things can move sort of quickly in that way. Um, and I think it, you know, maybe I keep saying filmic, but maybe a better description might be that like, it's a little like uh, a graphic novel or a comic book, right? Where the, the pictures aren't 
traditionally hyper-realist, but are rather suggestive of moments and zoom in in order to demonstrate emotions in a movement of time. And the, what do they call them? Gullies or alleys? Gutters. Gutters between the things do a lot of the work. Um, and the pacing because of that um, can jump in time or not jump in time significantly. And I think that that creates some of the pacing that also leaves room for some of the weirdness and just the invitation to accept that like, okay, we're now like, we're not going to discuss whether or not it's a wise decision to give up on the house or whether or not Carl's correct that Jack does not want to see the same things over and over. We're just going on a permanent road trip. We're not talking about whether or not that's coherent to Miriam's job or Carl's capacity or any of this. We're just doing it. I agree with you, Adam. I think um, in sitting with this question, one of the things I was thinking about most was coming in and out of scene and how we, we do move through time in this linear way that's not at all confusing. Um, but, you know, I think to think about um, you know, some of the other longer stories that we've read for story talk, like um, his mother's house, Edward P. Jones story, a story that's very preoccupied with um, tracking time and capturing time as it's felt and lived by most of us. Yeah. Um, Jones's stories feel longer to me, not in a bad way. I, I love being and staying with them and reading them and, you know, but I think, I think the thing that happens here that's really different is we're moving in and out of scene. We're not confused about time, crucially. Um, when we're moving in and out of those scenes, we're very clear on what the scene is. Um, and, you know, we transition out of it into another that we also clearly understand. We're not worried about time in the abstract. Or about tracking time because that the story setting is is so specific and so clear on you know where we are and what we're doing that you know I, I don't think about well how long are they driving the truck how, how long are they in the southwest um, it's not a story that's interested in those questions um, I think tonally, um, we'll get to this a little later, so I, I won't stay with it long, but it's also, it's very funny. Um, and I think that has something to do with the pacing. Um, it's kind of like you move from one quick punchline to another, and those punchlines have a different quality. Um, the variety um, helps with the pacing. I think also, um, this is an opportunity maybe to bring in the lamp. Uh, I think in thinking about pacing, like, I think the story is a little bit like the lamp. Um, so if I can read a little. Um, Miriam could not resist the allure of the little lamp. She often found herself sitting beside it, staring at it, the harsh brown hairs, the dainty pasterns, the polished black hooves, all fastened together with a brass gimp band in a space the size of a dinner plate. It was anarchy, the little lamp. Its legs snugly bunched. It was whirl, it was whole. It was the first far drums. She sometimes worried that she would begin talking to it. Um, so, I mean, I think even at the sentence level, like when we transition to a new kind of interesting thought, it always is gliding in a sensical way from that last thought. Um, but I mean, in terms of the lamp as metaphor for the story, I think the story is anarchy in this way, and the way it pulls off that anarchy is it makes total sense. I like that a lot. Uh... Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So the next question I was going to ask was about uh, the the uh, humor in the story. I think it's hilarious. I think the whole thing. It's 
it it jumps around, but as you say, like in an easy way to follow. Um, like one of the paragraphs is when they stop at the at a hotel, and like Miriam picks up some books and like reads about uh, how cactus have descended from roses, and then the next book talks about zebra hunting in Africa and like like right back to back that was the part that made me laugh out loud I have to say yeah I mean it's it's wild and you know I but it's it's not like in my mind like there are parts that are just like absolutely like laugh out loud but there's also a lot of just funny stuff on like a, a small level yeah like for example, when Adam was talking about the jelly cabinet, like having jelly in a sunroom, just the, like, just the idea of jelly just like sitting in sun without there actually being jelly there is funny. Um, so I just wondered, you know, how, like, can you break down how the humor is deployed in the story? Yeah, I think there's several versions of it, right? which is part of what you're getting at. Some of it's that like, you know, to that example that I just sort of arbitrarily picked that baking and football aren't the same kind of thing. And there's something, right? Like the title of the story is Congress, right? Which, um, you know, within the context of this story that largely cycles around ideas of love and relationships and connection, right? Like, isn't just like the immediate of like, most of us, I think, in this day and age, think of Congress as being like, when you say that word, right? Like, you know, America's parliament, you know? Um, as opposed to like the Congress of two people, sexual Congress, right? Like, or just intertwining of any kind um, and finding some kind of communion. Um, and I think that, right, one thing that's funny is that we do kind of, rightly or wrongly start to taxonomize things and put them into a realm or a category that they don't necessarily belong in. Um, and because this story is working through the kind of word and the ideas of the word, it pulls in a bunch of stuff that almost seems not to belong together. Um, sometimes it's like baking and football. And sometimes what that tells us is not only the silly thing of thinking about baking and football, but the ideas that we pull from baking and football about femininity and masculinity, about something as active as baking and passive as watching football. Um, if you're me, some people are very active football watchers and very passive bakers. Um, but I think some of it's also like the unexpected movement of the story makes everything sort of pop in an exclamatory way. Um, and I find that particularly interesting. Some of it has to do with, right, like the oddity of the imagery that if you describe anybody's house, um, like if you looked at my room or Ingrid's room or Matthew's room uh, and you just picked out like hyper-specific imagery, there's a kind of tendency there um, to be like, you know, bizarre in its description. And so it's not that something's so odd about having a jelly cabinet. It's that the statement of it doesn't necessarily give us the image of what it is. And so it leaves room for thinking about it being a cabinet full of jelly. And right, like all of those kinds of things start to like stick out. And some of it I think is just morbid humor, right? Like there's the black humor of like, sort of, you know, like the kind of mean sort of Hobbesian humor of like thinking about the woman who gets the information about her son and chooses to believe Jack, not because there's any particular evidence that Jack is right and the other investigators are wrong, but because like, ha ha ha, I'm so smart. I know that Jack might just be a fucking idiot who's like managed to weasel his way into this job that no other school has a program for because it may or may not be a real science. Um, or ha ha ha, like, you know, some guy is like, 
trying to sort of like love a cactus into its rose state, et cetera, and like get rid of its spines, which are its adaptation to its world. Like it's surviving this way and he's trying to, and he's just getting a handful of it. And then like this like poor Miriam thinking about love throughout the story, just thinking to herself, like somehow that's the loving thing is just fucking taking spines in the hand from a cactus because you believe that it hears you. Um, and I think that there's something right. Then like you turn that humor on yourself over the course of that, where you're kind of like laughing at Miriam getting invested in this thing and then like turning it back and going like, Oh shit. Like maybe that is what love is like. And maybe that's kind of like, I'm just missing it because I can't love my plants, <laughs> you know, like laughing at your own absurdities. Um, I think all of those things operate in this story. That's kind of a long litany, but I'm not even sure that covers just what's funny about the communication and all that, you know? Yeah, I think um, I, I spent a lot of time similarly thinking about um, Congress as like the putting together of things, as the lamps bundled, you know, strange legs and things that this story ends up bundling. Um, you know, like you, I think the football and um, the baking is, is one kind of pairing. The story is often doing that kind of pairing, even, even in that mode of humor we get different kinds of pairings. So, I mean, early on we get the woman who in her shopping cart has a big bag of bird seed and a bottle of vodka. Uh, I can't tell you exactly why that's funny, but it is. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think, I think we get lists of that kind. Um, it's also very funny to love a lamp and to start to inhabit the perspective of that lamp and to try to care for it. So, I mean, at the point um, Miriam and Carl and Jack hit the road um, and head, head out on their tour of the Southwest, um, you know, Miriam's kind of looking around and observing um, how the Southwest te treats the creatures that struggle to inhabit it. Uh, dead coyotes and hawks were nailed to fence posts and the road was hammered with the remains of lizards and snakes. Miriam was glad that the lamp was covered and did not have to suffer these sights. Uh, and, you know, she also frames this as a resentment toward non-human creatures. <laughs> you know, there, there's stuff like that. Um, her protectiveness of the lamp becomes funny. Um, I think sometimes like the action gets really weird too. Um, there's the moment where Miriam in a moment of like kind of displaced anger at this point, she and Carl and Jack have gone to a taxidermy museum where she slaps a man who's, um, you know, telling his child to say hi to the polar bears and kind of talking about the polar bear and its cubs as if they're living. Um, like the lamp's an okay thing to, you know, personify, but not the polar bear as a creature that it once was. Um, you know, moments of those, of sort of discordance. And then I think the bar scene too is just really, really funny. Um, I find like the agoraphobic, <laughs> like hilarious in terms of, in a lot of different ways. She, her name's Priscilla Dickman. And she says, I'm an ex agoraphobic, can I buy you a drink? Um, <laughs> she, you know, I mean, rings of like, I'm an ex alcoholic, but then like the way she goes on to define agoraphobia is, totally wrong um, in ways that are really funny. And sometimes the story is playing with that, kind of egging you on and seeing if you'll look up and check its facts. Um, at one point late in the story, um, I'm not gonna find it, but, uh, oh, actually, yes, I am. Um, the taxidermist is asking um, Miriam if she's read The Mirror of Simple 
annihilated souls and he's stuck in the word annihilated it's the title's actually mirror of simple souls and you know apparently the book is engaged with um, annihilation but you know funny to be messing around with reality in those ways yeah and if i can add something a little definitional i think that uh, personally, I distinguish between comedy and humor. I think this is a story that sort of involves both. I think comedy is sort of like laughing at something and saying, isn't that weird? And humor has a lot more to do with, right, the individual existing as the individual. And so bring to bear something about the absurdity of the rest of us. And I think this is a story that's particularly that has comedy, but also has humor, right? In that way, um, right? Like more modern stories that it looks like, you know, in terms of the sort of absurdity of conversation or something like uh, Raymond Carver's uh, The Train, which is a response to, uh, I think it's called The Train, uh, The 548 by uh, Cheever. Um, but I think, right, like it, this story is in a tradition that sort of like goes back to Gargantua and Pantagruel and like Quixote, Quixote, uh, um, with like the weirdness of the characters coming to the fore and somehow everyone else seeming more absurd as the result of characters who are not quite hinged in some way, like Panuj and Quixote and like all of these kinds of characters sort of like thrive here. I want to share my favorite line in this story. So what's happening here are a series of lines because they, they progress in that kind of weird way. Um, we're in the taxidermy museum and there are people chatting um, or just saying things out loud as they're looking at dead animals um, in these rooms of dead animals. My favorite is the wood ibis on a stump in a lonely swamp. Priscilla said cautiously. It couldn't be more properly delineated. That's a gorgeous specimen, all right. Not too many of those left, someone said. So much better than a zoo. Zoos are so depressing. I hear the animals are committing suicide in Detroit, hurling themselves into moats and drowning. I don't think other cities have that problem so much. Just Detroit. Even so, zoos. Oh, absolutely. This is much nicer. This is so much nicer. Shoot to kill, but not to mangle, Vern said. A lot of hunters just can't get that part down, Irene said. And then they think they can bring those creatures here to him? Uh, I think that, like, right, like, Right, like because we have a character who out of the agony of her own unsatisfactory relationship that at one point had a lot of potential for her, out of the sort of like trauma of her partner who even if she was losing affection for him, still took an arrow to the face. To the eye. Yeah, who's now non-communicative, right? Like she's communicating with a lamp out of her loneliness and like delusion. But all these, like this suggestion, just somebody claiming that animals are committing suicide by <laughs> diving in moats, attributing that information to the animals, but that's depressing to them. And then people taking it seriously and carrying on some kind of like conversation, like it was necessary to respond to that and treat it like a real thing. Um, and then like to only question it as to whether or not it was Detroit that was having this problem. Like, it seems so absurd. And I think it's that like, everyone levels out. It's not just that they're more ridiculous than she is, or that like, the dialogue is somehow witty. It's that I think you can go to museums and hear people say nonsensical shit like that. It's just not always so perfectly framed as it is here. Yeah, definitely. Um, <laughs> you know, and there's also like the only way that uh, 
Jack actually communicates is like through these bandits that he likes, you know, opening and then sticking on things. And at one point he sticks a bandaid on Miriam's hand and Carl's like, he likes you. <laughs> As if that hadn't been <laughs> obvious before he was injured to some extent, <laughs> you know? And, and so it's all, it, it's like, just, it's almost like putting the mundane, like up against what is considered weird. Yeah. And like showing that like the difference between the two is really nothing whatsoever. But it's like just a little bit there to, to make you question like what, what is real, what you think is real and what, what is like, you know, I don't know, some sort of fantasy. Um, but that line is, is so blurry here that everything becomes amazing. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, as humans, we often tell stories about ourselves to explain what happened, uh, why we are and why we act the way we do. And, you know, I think Williams uses a lot of what I'll call key words uh, in an unobtrusive way to direct readerly attention. Can you discuss the avenues this story led your mind down, even if not directly related to the plot and action? I've been thinking a lot about Campbell lately, and I think that uh, <laughs> I think that Joy Williams is at fault in part. I think about Campbell a lot anyway, but I think a lot about Campbell this week because of Joy Williams. Uh, I think there's something sort of wonderful about the question the story asks about what your life should be or can be or is, um, and asks a lot of interesting questions about what that is in relation to other people. Um, even if you haven't read the story, right? Like it's not accidental and it's a demonstration of like Joy Williams's quiet skill that right like the agoraphobic isn't quite sensibly agoraphobic or was agoraphobic but doesn't know how to communicate it right um and there's something you know about miriam's ability and ability to communicate with other people right like how you use your time and with whom you use it Right, whether or not a book is a valid use of time or a valid communion with other people, um, whether or not it matters what book it is, um, whether or not it matters if you're communing with a plant, right? Um, I think all of those things come up and also, right, like that something can interrupt all of that, right? What happens to Jack is Jack being Jack and Jack is a bad hunter and part of, right, like, I mentioned earlier that there's something frustrating about Jack to Miriam and the competence that he communicates about himself and whether or not he's actually that competent. Um, and he could be a very competent, we don't actually know. He might actually have a skill set that allows him to delineate who died in what way and whether or not they were, you know, alcoholic or not, or whether they were like, you know, you know. A little person who'd been eaten by a shark or whatever um that's a real example but uh, he does I, tack on like things like i think the shark was attracted to the ring on the hand of the person that the shark took the hand from yeah and we're never going to get that information and i think that's really or whether or not it's real um in the way that we're never really going to know even if there was a bird that just like birds were repeatedly flying into a moat in Detroit, right? Like, and that's how they were dying, right? Like to attribute something like sentient decision-making about suicide to an animal is an impossibility, but there's something really truly horrifying about the fact that we also can't do that, right? The thing that Miriam slaps somebody about is the fact that the bears are dead. And so they're not actually something you can say hello to. And that's from someone who is talking to disem 
embodied hooves that have become something else through their life. And I think that, right, there's something huge, there's this massive underlying question, right, about how we spend our lives, with whom we spend our lives, what a valid like interaction with the other people is, but it asserts at the same time that we have to commune with something and that something has to have something akin to human sentience in order for us to have that communion operate effectually. Um, and how we project that sentience onto other things has a massive effect on not only how we feel about what we're looking at, but what, um, what we choose to do, right? Like whether or not we choose to kill the animals depends on how we do it, whether or not it's okay to mangle the animals, right? Whether or not it's, there's, it's aggressive and they're being tacked to things or whether they're being re-enlivened, even if artificially with lamp or taxidermy, right? And right, like Jack becomes somehow more real to Carl um, as a disabled person and becomes something more like taxidermy to Miriam. And I think, right, like, those questions are huge, right? It's that I feel like I'm walking around it, but what I'm trying to say is that there's something in this story about the individual human impulse and the growth of that impulse, which might be metaphorically rose into cactus or animal into lamp. And then the alternative impulse, which is to try as an individual to like control something and turn it into something else. Like what is it Will Chamberlain whose uh, masculine living room is recreated. By like uh, 500 wolves. By five, yeah. Like, like wolf heads. And because it's a recreation, we also know that it's an artifice of that thing that involves 500 more wolf heads, um, right? And there's, there's something like serious, but I don't have the full kind of hypothesis for thesis for of what that is to be something that can look out at other things and then decide whether or not those things have the capability of looking back and what that does to who we become in the world. Yeah, I mean, it makes me think of, uh, I forget what Miriam's reading at the time, but at first she starts kind of communicating with the lamp just through her thoughts. Yeah. And there's the argument that they kind of have uh, on the idea of thought versus existence. Yeah. And like the separation between like, as you've said, like the person viewing the thing, like yourself versus how it would appear to someone else versus like reality or like what existence is. It's a very strange, like, you know, it's not even a bifurcation. It's like a try or something like more. Yeah. That, that is really unknowable, but so strange because everyone's, at, you know, has that moment where it's like, well, this is what I saw and this is what I felt. And like, you know, it's like, well, you can't sit over here and be like, you know, denying them outright because somehow their brains worked a certain way and that's what they really like think they saw or experienced. Yeah. And you as the perceiver get to decide the significance of that experience and whether or not it manifests something real and human and empathizable or silly or mechanical or, or what have you, which has a lot to do with your personal perspective. I guess um, to chime in here, I think, um, you know, like we've already talked about, I think Congress is one word that I spend time with. Um, I think about how we bundle things together and what, what actually is an opposite um, or a binary or, you know, an extreme and why, 
why I find the juxtaposition of certain things to be humorous. Um, my mind went there. I think this question stumped me at first, I admit, because I thought of this story less as having key words and more as having key statements. Um, although if I were pressed to choose a few words, I think existence is the first one other than Congress, I would, I would reach for. Um, misplaced is another um, personified um, object, life. Um, but I mean, I think in terms of like the road that I went down most, most ardently, um, independently is Matthew, like you, I got really interested in the Kierkegaard moment. Um, it's Miriam's first disagreement with the lamp. Uh, I think to read just a little bit of that moment. The night before Jack was to return home, they read a little book in which animals offered their prayers to God, the mouse, the bear, the turtle, and so on. And this is perhaps where the lamp and Miriam had their first disagreement. Miriam liked the little verses, but the lamp felt that the author clearly meant well. The, sorry, that though the author clearly meant well, the prayers were cloying and confused thought with existence. The lamp had witnessed a smattering of Kierkegaard and felt strongly that thought should never be confused with existence. Being in such a condition of peculiar and altered existence itself, the lamp felt some things unequivocally. Miriam often to want it, wanted to think about that other life, when the parts knew the whole, when the legs ran and rested and moved through woods washed by flowers, but the lamp did not want to reflect upon those times. Um, so I, I just hadn't read much of Kierkegaard before, and that felt like one of those key statements. Um, to me, there are a few others I'd point to, some involving the rose um, and others involving attention, both Miriam's and um, the lamps. <laughs> it's, you know, their inability to discern in terms of what they pay attention to. But I mean, I, I got curious about Kierkegaard and kind of read the Wikipedia gloss and I found that one thing that he's interested in per the gloss, again, like, you know, this is not the philosophical version, um, is the leap of faith and the sort of tension between rationality and faith or, or love. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think the story seems preoccupied with existence in terms of what actually is alive and what exists. I mean, Miriam at one point <laughs> compares Jack and his appearance to a large white appliance. <laughs> um, she, she doesn't distinguish very well between you know, the sentient and the non-sentient in this story. And I mean, lamp is especially interesting in that it's got a little part of something that once lived in it. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think that's something the story is coming at from a lot of different angles. Uh, we see dead animals, we see a desert where it's difficult to survive. Um, we see, you know, people who are starved for attention in that desert. We see taxidermy life. Um, we see that compared with a zoo and, you know, we get to think about, well, can those things be compared really? And if so, you know, is conservation of that kind better than an imprisoned existence and things like that? Um, you know, I think the story is really engaged with it. And I mean, even perhaps engaged with Kierkegaard more deeply. Um, I've read that stylistically, again, this is Wikipedia, <laughs> I'm making myself sound like more of an expert here than I am, but. Uh, I hear that stylistically he was very interested in the paradox, and I think stylistically that's exactly what this story is interested in. Um, you know, what is that moment with the polar bear, if not paradoxical? Yeah, I think.
Yeah, I think Kierkegaard's really uh, wild in that way, right? Like, he's got this really bizarre book called Either Or, and it uh, sort of explores the options of choice and how we think about things, but Kierkegaard's always really, you know, he's also super obsessed with questions of faith and belief and sort of what real human connection is and the ways in which communication of certain sort of artificial social kinds can get in the way. Um, and Ingrid, you talking about some of that brings me to this thought um, on page 44, um, Miriam's uh, talking with the taxidermist and uh, the taxidermist says, the only thing you have to know is that you can answer them any way you want. This is in reference to the questions that people come to the taxidermist with. Um, and they are, uh, though he's slightly um, oracular in his position, right? Like the only questions we actually get are sort of about the taxidermy. Um, the questions are pretty much the same. So you'll go nuts if you don't change the answers. I'll think about it, Miriam said, but actually she was thinking about the lamp. The odd thing was she had never been in love with an animal. <laughs> she had just skipped that cross species eroticism <laughs> and gone right beyond it to altered parts. <laughs> there was something wrong with that, she thought. It was so hopeless. Well, love was hopeless. Can we start thinking a little bit about like, what if instead of loving cars, like an old Model A or Model T, like you were in love with like, the tire? <laughs> we all think of it. I don't know, some spare part. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna read the next line just to share with, I actually, my copy of this book, or the one that I have here is, uh, I had some students of mine do a, an exercise where they marked significant things throughout a book to sort of follow an author's tendency. Shout out to Zach, who uh, after this sentence, I have certain responsibilities, Miriam said, I have a lamp, writes, and a husband. <laughs> um, and what I like about Zach's thinking <laughs> is that, right, like Zach is thinking out sort of from the human perspective, the human perspective, and driving right past the cross species slash altered parts eroticism thing and just worrying about what the expectations are. And, um, and in some ways, like both with that simple answer misses the point completely and nails the point, which is that, right? Like there isn't an inherent progression from loving people to animals, to animal parts in our empathy. <laughs> um, it's, it's way stranger than that, right? Like, and we have to kind of have a faith in the way that we love things and love can feel really, I don't know that it is hopeless, it can certainly feel hopeless because it's so impossible to know what direction to feel affection and connection. And, you know, if you happen to be an artist, if you draw or paint or sculpt or even write words, you have to develop a relationship that's deeply intimate to stuff that is not, that. or even if you're a horticulturist, right? Like, um, you know, just like hanging out botanizing your cactuses with love and being brutalized by them you know like there's something really interesting about that yeah i'm gonna butcher this example a little bit but i mean one that came up in my wikipedia yeah, was having like a table with like maybe a pencil on it in front of you and not not having that not necessitating a leap in faith to believe in that's existence because it's in front of you and you can see it. And I think the idea was that for Kierkegaard, faith and doubt must coexist, not because 
things, you know, have to be confusing, but because to get to faith at all, you have to have a modicum of doubt, otherwise it isn't faith. Gotcha. So I thought uh, we could end this uh, conversation thinking about uh, why it is so easy to swindle and be swindled in, in all the senses that we've been talking about. Yeah. Um, I think it's so easy to be swindled because, right, like we want, I think it's something, right, like we're communal creatures, right? And I think we would be instinctually communal creatures just by the nature of our bag, right? Like we have this, like one of the longest gestation periods in the animal kingdom. And also one of the longest like childhood adolescent periods in the animal kingdom. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the sort of like unfortunate size of our brains and stomachs compared to the rest of us. And like the extra energy it takes to hold a spine up with two legs, you know? Um, and so, you know, the ways that like human beings have survived in the universe, or if you prefer a uh, Kierkegaardian faith of some kind that God made humans to survive, um, involves the fact that we are, right, to bastardize a quote from Hannah Arendt, like, there is not man in the world, there are men in the world. Um, right, that we're always here with each other and the ways in which we understand something like a story comes out of language. And even if we want to sort of like be hermits, right, um, I'm still sort of bastardizing Hannah Arendt to say this, but like that we wish that we could sometimes be alone and secluded or, you know, bootstrap our way or make it on our own or like whatever that bullshit is, but it's all bullshit. It's bullshit because the way in which we understand those concepts comes through the language um, of our experience and the language of our experience comes from other people in a communal life. And the ideas we have come out of that language and the experiences that we've had in that language and we've been put into through communal experiences with other people, right? Every counterculturalist is dependent on the culture in which they live, and so you never escape it. Um, and that that can progress; it can go to new and exciting places. Um, but you never get out of it, right? And we're also a kind of animal that goes through a hedonic treadmill cycle constantly. The way we sort of understand happiness and joy is always in this kind of binary relationship to how, what, you know, like there's homeostasis and then there's shit we don't like. And then there's the relief of having something above and beyond homeostasis, which is to recognize that there's just no shit we dislike about something for half a second. And to want to keep that, right? The like joy of wild sex and being loved by someone who loves that you're into wild sex and them and they're exciting and they can do this magic stuff always comes with the reality that like you get accustomed to someone's bullshit and like, and you doubt their bullshit and you go through things and like, right? Like even yourself, right? Even if it's just yourself talking to a lamp that is not actually sentient, it's just you talking to yourself because you're reading some Kierkegaard and arguing. And we want to believe that we can actualize our ideals, right? But our ideals are sort of fantastical, right? Like part of Kierkegaard's recognition, part of a lot of philosophical recognition after Descartes is that Descartes claim that there is a God because he can imagine a God and he can imagine perfect things is bullshit, right? That's a manifestation of language. Um, and so we want those things, right? We want to feel not only 
happiness, but we want happiness outside the context of something else. We want to feel love and we want love to not come with any of the thorns from the cactus. And I, I think that it's easy to tell yourself that, which is why it's easy to be swindled and other people tell themselves that. And so they swindle, and it's not always personal and sociopathic and mean, and it's usually not. It's, it's the attempt to, it's the attempt to have something that's intricately and, and determinedly human and out of the kind of animal that a human being is. And uh, to look for that even in, in roadkill, you know? And uh, I think that's, that's not so bad um, but recognizing it and figuring out how to relate to it is a worthy endeavor that this story is taking on. I'll come at this from a little bit of an unusual angle. Um, I was at work the other day and um, someone called and he wanted to send us a manual for a printer and he was in this kind of staggered way, like asking for information. He was asking for, was trying to confirm the address, trying to confirm the model number. Um, and there was something about it that made me wary of him. Um, and, you know, I think he's likely made other people wary in that same way because he was being a little um, cautious with me that he was saying things like, oh, well, like, this is free, don't worry. Um, being reassuring in certain ways um, that put me on my guard. Um, I was trying to do my job and make sure that we got this manual if we needed it or, you know, if this wasn't some kind of scam. And um, it turned out it wasn't. It was just kind of a weird interchange, but I mean, I think it mirrored things that put me on guard. Um, I think in terms of being swindled, there are things that were primed for, and then there are situations that are a little more like the Hobbesian like social contract, where like, it would be too much to assume that every person around us is a murderer, even though I start to a little when. I watch too much Criminal Minds. I knew I'd find a way to work that in. Um, yes. And I did it. Um, you know, I mean, I think in this story, what's interesting about the leaps of faith that we see is Miriam wants to care for this lamp um, and wants to believe that it feels things and is connected to her and her eating and so the leap is no problem. Um, and I think similarly at the taxidermy museum where you have people coming back to this place and treating this taxidermist like an oracle, um, it's, it's because of a little bit of wish fulfillment. Um, you know, there's something that he's giving to these people that they want. Um, they're not, they don't have reason to distrust his answers. Exactly. I mean, what, what what's kind of odd is, you know, he does give different answers, various those answers, but people seem to feel because of his delivery and, you know, he must be a good swindler. Um, that, you know, even when his answers change, that the answers are to do with them. Um, there's the tree hugger, um, it's a big bargain um, with the owner. Um, and she, she, someone has already asked um, the taxidermist his, her question. Um, and she feels like his answer would have changed in a positive way if she had asked the question. So, you know, I'm mean, going to think easy to be swindled when the swindler is, is fulfilling a need or a wish, I guess is my answer. Yeah, I think that's really interesting and maybe like leans into, right, like 
that thing you said, Ingrid, about that they are getting something out of it, right? Like it doesn't matter if the oracle is giving you the right answer. It matters that the oracle is giving you an answer in a way that relieves you of having the question. Yeah, I think one, one other thing I'd add, I would just, I mean, in terms of the social contract thing, I think my idea around that is that, like, you know, I mean, in terms of trust, um, I think the best way to know if you can trust someone is to just trust them. Um, and, you know, a lot of us feel like badly when we've been swindled or duped in some way as if it were our fault and not you know, someone acting in a way that's unfair or mean-spirited or inappropriately toward us. Um, like, that trust can be a really beautiful thing. And it's like, why should we bring skepticism to every encounter? Well, friends, thank you for a very enjoyable conversation on Joy Williams. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to say I demand that you go out and read some Joy Williams, but then I would just be a swindler like everybody else. <laughs> so thanks for joining me tonight. Check out some Joy Williams. Thanks for bringing her here, Doc. Thanks so much, Matthew. Mm -hmm.